he had a history of problems with vaccinations. His physician suffered a bona fide, uh, uh, submitted a bona fide medical exemption request, but that was denied by the educational administrator's self-appointed task force. After all avenues for receiving his waiver had been exhausted, and believing he had no choice or he would lose his career and be unable to pay his mortgage and be, to go homeless, this young man succumbed to the pressure and received the AstraZeneca vaccine. Shortly thereafter, he had a massive stroke with an 18 millimeter blood clot to his brain. His neurologist and cardiologist declared it to be idiopathic, which means arising spontaneously or from an unscure, unknown cause as he was a physically fit and able and active young man who adhered to the Adventist health, style, health message and lifestyle. Almost two years later, he remains at home, partially paralyzed, unable to engage in work. He has lost his income, he's lost his home. His mother has resigned her nursing job to look after him 24 seven, because he now needs nursing care around the clock. The Australian Union and his local conference have turned their backs on him and his repeated requests for assistance. I've read the paperwork, I won't show it here, but essentially they've said, we fulfilled our legal responsibilities, you're on your own. Although they did say to him that if he recovers from the, the impact of this stroke, of which the cause, they, they, know, they do not know what the cause of that stroke is, they'll be happy to re-employ him as a teacher. That's good and comforting news for him. Well, remember he took the AstraZeneca vaccine, in 22, the AstraZeneca vaccine had already been banned in many countries around the world because it causes brain bleeds. In spring of 23, much to the young man's chagrin, the Australian government banned the AstraZeneca shots nationwide because they were determined to be linked with brain bleeds and strokes, as this man had experienced. And finally, in May 2024, AstraZeneca withdrew their vaccines worldwide after admitting in a UK court the relationship between, uh, with, with brain bleeds and strokes. That which was safe and effective, officially, that which was mandated by our church administrators, with calamitous effect, was then banned overnight by the Australian government precisely because it was not safe and effective. So far, the conference and the Australian Union have denied any and all responsibility for their part in this mess. The structure sails on, leaving broken bodies, destroyed lives, and betrayed trust in its wake. And nobody seems to care. But this is wrong. This is profoundly wrong. This is a human case study of what happens when church administrators overstep their boundaries and deny members the ability to follow the dictates on the conscience of the Holy Spirit. And the church just, the hierarchy just moves, sails on as if nothing has happened, leaving broken bodies and destroyed lives in its wake. This is what happens when our GC administrators make illegitimate decisions overstep their defined boundaries of delegated authority and assume the right to trample on liberty of conscience. Had that man's request for a religious exemption been honored, he would still be working today. But his life has been destroyed by the actions of those administrators. Personally, I probably this statement, this statement will get me into trouble. I believe that every general conference administrator who was party to that reaffirmation statement should resign immediately because they overstep their authority with catastrophic impact on the lives of innocent Adventists worldwide. Amen. I think they should resign. Amen. They no longer have our confidence. So what are the implications? Well, it's difficult, to, it's difficult to talk about this because had the General Conference said, with hindsight, we recognize we've made a mistake and therefore we want to, we want to recognize we've made a mistake, we want to apologize, how can we make this better? And let's make sure we don't make these kind of mistakes again. What has actually happened is the General Conference issued a statement defined, defending their right to make such statements. We discussed that last night. And they have uh, basically um, cancelled any and all possibility of any discussion about their authority to make that statement. After my appeal to Adventist Nobility Sermon in January 2022, the GC issued a, glo a global condemnation in Adventist News Network of any who would question their authority. To prevent any discussion at the 2022 GC session, the GC ADCOM stripped me of my delegate status because they didn't want me to speak up and raise this question from the floor. When attorney Zirkel from California, from Loma Linda, made a motion to add the vaccine statement to the GC agenda in 22, Elder Wilson squashed that motion from the front. And you saw that last night. The Liberty and Health Alliance uh, put together a petition to the General Conference Administrators 
almost 25,000 Adventist pastors, doctors, nurses, members worldwide signed that petition, and no response was ever given to that petition. When Pastor Wilson did a question and answer with members at the Granite Bay Church in February 23, over 1,100 members were present. And they were encouraged to type on their cell phones and type in a question, and Elder Wilson sat on the panel with a couple of other pastors, like Pastor James Rafferty from 3ABN and so forth, and the number one question, because people could vote for it, the number one question that was up on the screen the whole afternoon was why did the GC issue the reaffirmation statement that hurt so many Adventists? And for the entire afternoon, the panel refused to take that question, even though it had about 1,150 votes out of the people present. Essentially, our leaders are now hiding behind their lawyers. No discussion is possible, but we need a process of forgiveness, of reconciliation and healing to begin and that requires courage on the part of all parties. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And it is incumbent, I believe, upon our GC leadership to recognize their role in what has happened and to make the first step to reconciliation with the members who've been hurt by their illegitimate actions. So over the years, I believe we have morphed. We began in the 1860s identifying as God's end time remnant movement in prophecy, as the remnant movement of prophecy, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. As the end time remnant people of God, we were fundamentally at odds with our wider environment. The USA was the second beast of Revelation 13, one of the end time foes of God's people. But over the years, we have morphed. Lest we talk about remnant church, we become a respectable church. We crave and receive tax-exempt status, federal contracts for our colleges and our hospitals, subsidies and scholarships for our students. No longer are we fundamentally at odds with our wider environment. We've become fundamentally at ease with our wider environment. During the pandemic, when faced by huge social, economic, political, and media pressure, we morphed again. We didn't go back to becoming a remnant church. We ceased to be a respectable church. We became a regime church. We propagated the official lies. We canceled the truth speakers in our midst. We demonized our members who would not bow to the lies. And we chased federal funding for our institutions. It's not easy to talk like this, but this is the truth. And for us to have healing in our church, we have to speak the truth. In love, but we have to speak the truth. We became a regime church. Um, implementing the dictates of a godless government that has no place for God in its, in its deliberations, and we acted against our own members to preserve our, re our revenue streams and our institutions. This is nothing new. In World War I, the Adventist Church in Germany supported the Kaiser Wilhelm regime over biblical truth and the concerns of the members. We encouraged our young people to sign up to fight for the Kaiser, and we encouraged our members to work in the munition factories, including on the Sabbath. As a result of this, the SDA reform movement um, was born. In the USSR, the SDA church supported the communist demand for young Adventists to enter the Red Army in 1928. We changed in 1920. We said that Adventists are conscientious objectors to military service. And in 1924, under pressure from Joseph Stalin's regime, uh, the all-Soviet SDA Congress, we changed our position slightly. So we said, now it's up to the individual conscience of our young men whether they serve in the Red Army or not. And in 1928, the position changed again after further pressure from the Soviets, and the all-Soviet Adventist Congress voted um, to support and recommend our young men serving in the Red Army, as a result of which the underground SDA church began, and they were called the True and Free SDA Movement. And they lasted almost 70 years as an underground Adventist movement, faithful to the Lord until the Soviet Union collapsed. In, the, in Vietnam to this day, 2024, the communist government expects school children to attend school on Sabbath mornings. And there is in Vietnam today an official Adventist church who send their children to school on Sabbath morning. And there is an underground Adventist church, many times larger than the official church. And they refuse to send their children to school on the Sabbath mornings. Historically, when Adventism faces totalitarian demands, we have split. We have retained an official Adventist church that has survived the regime. We thank the Lord for that. But they have always yielded to the regime's unscriptural rules, and they've sacrificed our members and beliefs in order to save our institutions. We have also had a split where an underground Adventist church comes into being in the same country, and that underground church is true to scripture. 
That's what has happened historically in Adventism. Now, time and again, when those, uh, those regimes fall, there's a process of reconciliation that takes place. And in some parts of the world, that reconciliation is more advanced than in other parts of the world. But some of these divisions between those who bow to the totalitarian demands and those who are faithful to scripture and who are demonized by the official church, some of those divisions exist today around the world church. We may not be familiar with that too much in Maine, but as one who travels the world, I can tell you those divisions are still known by members who've gone through the trauma of a totalitarian regime. And I would say this uh, at this moment here, don't think for a minute that you know which group you would be in when totalitarian demands come your way. Nobody really knows how they're going to respond to a matter of life and death. Nobody really knows how you would respond to the threat of a bullet from the KGB or the, or the, or the, um, the Gestapo. Nobody really knows. So as we look back on this history, rather than saying this group is bad or this group is wrong or this group is good, we say, thank you, Lord, that I was not forced to make that decision myself. And by the grace